Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first global virtual accelerator for startups. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, build a trillion dollars of global GDP and 10 million jobs. And in support of the mission, we have been doing these free mentoring roundtables for years and years and years. Actually, it predates the 1M1M program. We started doing these in the fall of 2008 as an experiment, and then that eventually blossomed into the full 1M1M virtual accelerator program in its current incarnation. So this is the 379th session of our free roundtable. The event is being recorded. You will find this and all other recordings on our YouTube channel, which is also chock full of other video content, which is good learning material for those of you who are interested in using video learning. And um, if you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. And our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and at Shromana. We publish a huge amount of rich, interesting, inspirational, educational content that you can access through the Twitter channel. These are the call-in instructions. Remember, this is a round table, not a broadcast, so we want you to participate. We will open the line up for participation in due course, but first we have some uh, programming to do. And that, we will start with a conversation with John Frankel, partner of FF Venture Capital. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So tell us about your investing focus. How big is the fund? What size investments do you make? Let's uh, get to know one another. So we're a New York-based seed stage firm. We look to invest in companies when they're just getting going, when there's three or four entrepreneurs in a room. And we really work hard to help build them up to being teams of 30 and 40 and beyond. So we invest from that seed round to an early B round. As I mentioned, we're based in New York. We invest across the country, um, primarily focused on U.S. There's a couple of exceptions into Israel and uh, Canada and the like. Mm -hmm. And when we look at our portfolio, it's predominantly enterprise, uh, probably about 75% enterprise, 25% consumer, we focuses on cybersecurity, AI, drones, and robotics, and of course, as we're based in New York, some FinTech. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you say uh, seed, could you actually elaborate on that? How do you define seed? You know, uh, as I keep pointing out in these sessions, when I was uh, raising money in the, throughout the mid-90s, I did three startups in the mid-90s, um, it was seed of Series A, but in the last few years, the seed ecosystem has become very segmented. There are tons of micro VC funds, and they each specialize in certain pieces of the seed equation. There is pre-seed, seed, post-seed, pre-Series A, Series A. So if you were to pinpoint your preference, where would that be? Well, I, I, I think you're right. I think the language um, uh, does a disservice. We think of seed as being a million and a half round uh, at a mid to low single digit valuation on the company. So it's when a company is just getting going. And, you know, our objective is because we run with a large team is really to work with that company and help them understand all the pieces they don't have because they're a small team themselves. And we can bring a considerable amount to the table to help them understand the business side of what they're trying to do and really build it into a successful large, large franchise. We've been doing this now almost 10 years. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we have some larger companies in the portfolio, companies like Indiegogo and Ionic Security, the Still Networks. Uh, and companies that have grown from, I think, um, I'll give you an example, we invested in Plated uh, a little under five years ago when there were seven people. When they sold to Albertsons recently, there were 700 people in the organization. Mm -hmm. So um, I imagine since you're doing enterprise um, to a large extent, 
you're seeing mostly SaaS business models. Is that an accurate uh, assumption? I mean, predominantly SaaS. Some are royalty-based. Uh, but it's predominantly um, a software-as-a-service model, yes. So uh, before you're willing to put in a million and a half into a um, SaaS deal, what do you want to see in terms of validation? Is it revenue, pre-revenue? What kind of MRR if it's revenue? Can you double-click on that for us? Yes, well, so, so, so a point of clarification. The round size is... Uh, the way we get started, often around about a million and a half to two million. Our initial mm -hmm. check is usually close to 600,000. So we like to syndicate deals. We like to bring other smart investors around the table. Um, we don't right. try to crowd others out around us. That's, that's fine. But before a company can today, you know, before a company can raise a million and a half, two million dollars, it seems like even, you know, if you call that a seed round, you could also call that a small Series A or a pre-Series A, but whatever be the terminology, to put in that money, people are asking for validation already. Is that your point of view as well? That's, that's what I'm trying to understand is what is it that you're looking for? Not always. Not always. It, it really depends on the entrepreneur, the mm -hmm. space they're going after, um, and the like. If someone comes in with... Uh, considerable domain expertise, capability, yeah. and the like. We're less focused on initial traction. It's nice mm -hmm. to have, but it's not necessary. You know, uh, there's a company called Drop Loyalty, which is cross-platform loyalty. They launched initially in Canada. They're now growing rapidly in the U.S. And mm -hmm. you effectively get points. Uh, for doing very, very little. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And they then allow you to spend those points on brands that you really care about. It's a very millennial-focused set of brands that they're working with. And when the CEO came in and we sat down with him, you know, we gave him a check based off of, you know, a business model. And now, a few years later, this is a company growing multiple folds year over year. Um, mm -hmm and doing considerably well. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be uh, a certain amount of MRR and a certain amount of traction. Uh, we're willing That's to good. look beyond just the metrics. That's good. This is, that point of view is becoming fewer and far between these days. Everybody wants people to do all the bootstrapping and validation and get to you know, a significant MRR before they're willing to write any checks. And that, that's really tough for entrepreneurs. It, it is tough. Look, traditionally, you bootstrap. Then you raise, yeah. you know, somewhere between a, a quarter million to three quarters of a million from friends and family, and maybe a couple of angels. And then that first institutional round, that million and a half, two million round, is where we tend to come in. Yeah. So uh, let's look at 2017. We are, you know, this is our last round table. We are about to close the year off. Um, you have, I imagine, seen thousands of deals this year. What are the trends in your deal flow? So what are the trends? Uh, you know, we, we've been leaning heavily into AI, cybersecurity, um, mm -hmm. uh, drones, robotics, fintech, as I mentioned. And we're seeing a ton of opportunity in those spaces. Uh, and mm -hmm. the reality is, I guess, AI isn't a space, it's a tool set. And so um, you're going to see AI embedded in almost everything over time, just the way mobile is uh, or SaaS is when you look at um, uh, enterprise. Yeah. With regard to um, other trends, obviously there's a lot of noise, excitement, and manic behavior around um, blockchain and ICOs. And mm -hmm. we're studying it and we're looking at it. Um, uh, but it's not necessarily an area that we think uh, institutional capital should be playing in today. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, uh, we're trying to understand the blockchain phenomenon and ICO phenomenon as well, and, and uh, it seems very capital intensive, although we have had some uh, entrepreneurs uh, actually come here. Vinnie Lingam has raised a $2 million um, on an ICO for his venture, 
which uh, he wasn't being able to raise venture capital for that particular venture, and he went and did it as an ICO. Um, so he basically raised seed capital using an ICO. Are you seeing much of this uh, in your uh, orbit? Well, you, you shouldn't confuse an ICO with seed capital. You know, venture capitalists and Normally not. Companies. <laughs> Normally no, 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 not, but, but, but this particular entrepreneur no, but, but, specifically that. No, I understand, but I, and maybe I'm being pedantic here. The venture capitalists tend to invest in equity and or lend money through convertible notes to convert into equity into companies. An ICO is an offering of coins, and those coins are, yeah. are generally controlled by a foundation, and they're separate right. from the company itself, which pays the people's employees. So there's a question of oversight. There's a question of governance um, that often isn't being addressed. Now, that being said, we definitely see some companies that cannot raise money from venture capitalists raising money on ICOs, and we're seeing some very interesting projects being kicked off through either an ICO or SAP, okay. a security for future token. Um, the valuations are about a hundred times um, <laughs> what one might consider to be reasonable <laughs> in some cases, and um, so it certainly gives a, a pause for thought here. And as we know, not all tokens are going to end up being valuable at the end of the day. So I think it's That's an right. interesting space. I think as students of the market, we need to understand it. And uh, a ton of money will be made in that space, both by entrepreneurs and by investors, and also a ton of money will be lost in the space, less so by entrepreneurs and more so by investors. So I think it's, it's, it's an it's a area that requires a lot of studying and understanding. And if, you know, the test for an entrepreneur really should be, does the business that I'm trying to build does it require a blockchain token that yep. is not only sufficient but necessary? Yeah. And do you know will the solution be ten times more efficient, or alternatively, be you know enable a solution at one tenth the cost it would otherwise be? And I think if you hit those criteria, then it's incredibly valuable. But we've yeah. seen a lot of tokens for things which. Um, uh, seems tangential that there has to be blockchain involved. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, uh, to me, it seems like the early days of the crowdfunding um, trend, right? So for a while, everybody's like, oh, crowdfunding is going to solve all early stage financing problems, and I never thought so. Crowdfunding eventually ended up finding its niche, and it hasn't become the be all end all solution to early stage financing at all. It has well, found I, its biggest niche at uh, just a second, it's found its biggest niche in uh, you know, pre ordering physical products usually and, and that's the one place where it has made a significant difference in terms of early stage financing. But equity crowds crowdfunding of very complex technologies just hasn't taken off. Well it's kind of interesting. I would still say we're in the very early days. You've had some early adopters who've been burnt on some of these pre-ordering of products. And mm -hmm. I think the space has cooled off with regard to crowdfunding um, for, for product. Uh, I actually think the space probably shrunk last year. Uh, mm -hmm. That being said, we're investors in Indiegogo. Uh, Indiegogo has looked at the problem differently, and they said equi equity funding for product is interesting, but what are the other things we can do to really help entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. So they have a partnership with Arrow over building hardware, they have partnerships yeah. with marketers, they build a marketplace, their on-demand space, uh, which um, uh, really allows for entrepreneurs, once the crowdfunding is ended, to have a virtual shop, they have a partnership uh, with Brookstone, uh, they also do equity crowdfunding, and they've been very mm -hmm. successful in the space, very quiet and very successful. And then they launched, I believe, only last week, uh, a platform to support ICOs. And their first uh, ICO is actually going incredibly well. 
And I think what they bring to the table is something that's missing with a lot of these, which is credibility. You know, their projects that they're going to allow on their platform are pre-screened for being a scam or not a scam. I don't use mm -hmm. that term, but pre-screened for being reasonable. And um, they think that by really um, sort of providing a, uh, a legitimate uh, space for ICOs uh, to be issued, that they're actually doing a mm -hmm. service to the space and a service to entrepreneurs, and I would agree. That is a very reasonable strategy for Indiegogo. Now, what uh, you mentioned that Indiegogo's crowd, uh, equity crowdfunding platform has been successful. What are the trends? What kind of ventures are gaining traction in the equity crowdfunding world of Indiegogo? Well, Outside I mean, so of the advanced what, product sale. Right. I think a lot of the things they've been going for are sort of what you might consider to be lower beta type projects ones which, mm -hmm. you know, may not be shooting a hundred times returns, um, but nevertheless are ones where those businesses within the community can really do well. So maybe less of the kinds of things that the venture capitalists tend to put capital behind. But, mm -hmm. you know, as I say, I think we're in the early, early days of it. I think it's too early to say that crowdfunding is in the niche. And if you want to call an inning, I think we're somewhere between the first and second inning here with regard mm -hmm. to um, the opportunities that crowdfunding will bring. So we have uh, entrepreneurs in our portfolio who may be interested in looking at uh, maybe working with Indiegogo on some of their equity funds, crowdfunding stuff. You know, we do a lot of bootstrapping uh, oriented ventures. Our goal is not to fund with venture capital a million entrepreneurs. Our goal is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in annual revenue. So we do support a lot of entrepreneurs that are not right. uh, hitting for the home runs or, or going for those uh, huge outcomes, outsized outcomes. So that there may be a, an opportunity for us to work with Indiegogo on some of these. And, and absolutely, absolutely. Their uh, chief business development officer is Slava Rubin, who um, uh, co-founded the uh, company with Danae Ringelman, gosh, uh, over seven years ago. And okay. um, on Twitter, he's at, at GoGoSlava, so he's going to hate, hate me for, for putting out his Twitter handle, but he's got a great <laughs> project. You know, he's got a great well, project. Ask reach, him, reach out to, reach out you, to Slava. If you would, um, ask him to contact me, and then we can I can, you know, put him in touch with the the projects that have we have vetted and we have we think are are good projects and that may be worthwhile for them to look at. So we can do it at the this dev level as opposed to the individual entrepreneur level. I think that's a great idea, but we'll just keep it between ourselves. Yes, I think so. <laughs> All right. So next question. <laughs> next question. Um, You've talked quite a bit about Indiegogo, which has been very interesting. Talk a bit more about your current portfolio. You talk about cybersecurity being an interesting area. Now, cybersecurity, as we both know from having been in this industry for a long time, is a very, very crowded market. From the beginning of venture capital, it has been one of the hottest areas of venture capital, and incessantly so. For 20 years, people have been invested in cybersecurity. So how do you far cybersecurity opportunities. We have cybersecurity in our portfolio as well. So help us understand wh what is the thought process that you apply for those kinds of deals? So we think it's the gift that keeps on giving because it's like an arms race. And as time goes by and new platforms come along, it's important to protect them. And there's a number of, I mean, we look at cybersecurity as really four main categories. One is perimeter protection. And so mm -hmm. companies uh, like the Still Networks sort of fit into that. Uh, another one, uh, once someone gets in the network, um, monitoring attacks as they happen or before they happen. And that's where a company like CyberX would play. Mm -hmm. Then there's a whole series of ones around identity, really knowing who's accessing the system. So that's where a company like Unity or um, um, uh, Greathorn um, 
or secure comes into play. Um, and in the fourth category, and this is one where there isn't a lot of, uh, uh, this is a space that we think is, is increasingly important, is around prevention. And mm -hmm. uh, we invested in a company, gosh, a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, called Doc Authority, that really mm -hmm. sort of monitors in real time all the documents large organizations have and seeing who has access and who should have access. And that can then fit into the, perim the perimeter defenses so that important documents don't get downloaded onto a thumb drive or emailed out of the organization. So we see it as those sort of four areas. The area that we think is going to come along over the next few years is uh, AI-based attacks. A lot of the attacks today are automated, but they're not really AI learning-based systems that are being used yet. And so we, we see this as, a, as an arms race. We're very interested in, um, in um, uh, defenses that can be sort of uh, learning uh, around how to uh, defend against that. But we, we think it's a fascinating space. And uh, when you look at enterprise, are you also looking at the mid-sized um, enterprises or is it just large enterprise? No, no, we look, we look at all, but I will tell you, I'll tell you a little secret. Most SaaS companies think they should start with the small businesses and work their way up. What we've seen is the ones that seem to be successful most are the ones who start with solving the problems of the largest companies and work their way down. Well, it depends. We have one company that we look up to very much, and uh, it's an entrepreneur that I've known very well for 10 years. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met him, uh, Sridhar Vembu, who has done Zoho. Zoho is going to do a billion dollars in revenue next year, and they nice. go after the very small businesses, and they've really done a superb job. It's a completely bootstrap company, not one penny of venture capital in the business. And it's, it's a that's, really that's superb. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you a few trend questions, John. Uh, first of those is, how do you process the current investment climate where capital is moving further and further upstream? How does a seed investor mitigate the Series A gap? With all these micro VCs um, who have come into the market, there is really a lot of seed capital available. And the number of uh, seed investments that are happening have gone up, you know, 50,000 to 70,000 seed investments a year. I don't know what will be this year's number, but that has been in the last few years, since 2013, I think. So, um, but the Series A number or venture capital financing number has kind of stayed steady at 1,200 to 1,500. So what, um, what is your, um, how do you parse this trend is my real question. So, so it's, it's really interesting. There's a lot of data points out there and it's easy to string them together into a story. The thing to understand this is once a venture capitalist invests, probably two-thirds of their portfolio goes nowhere. One-third gets written off, one-third, maybe you get your capital back. The last third is where the returns are, and a third of the third, or 10% of the portfolio, is where you're really going to make a difference with regard to your portfolio returns. And that's after a DC invests. And so mm -hmm. if you take a 1,000 deals, Actually, probably take that back. Take 10,000 deals that VCs look at. They may invest in 100, and out of the 100, 10 are the ones that are really going to move the portfolio. And out of those yeah. 10, 9 of the 10 are probably going to be sold, and only one goes public. So if you think about that sort of filter as it goes along, there's a series C gap, there's a series A gap, there's a series B gap, there's a series... There's a, there's a winnowing down at every single stage. And, um, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of talk uh, that there's 200 seed funds in New York and there's 600 new uh, venture capital funds that didn't exist a couple of years ago that are raising right. capital. Um, and then you go and talk to people in the angel networks and they say, well, you know, angels are a little bit less um, 
engaged than they used to be. They're a little sort of exhausted by putting capital to work. And then you look at something like um, uh, AngelList, which used to allow anybody to post any deal on the platform. Now they're very selective. So I think there's, there's things that indicate there's more capital. There's things that indicate there's less capital. Ultimately, the good capitals work their way through all, the good companies work their way through all of these stages and do incredibly well. And I think what's most important for an entrepreneur to do is to find a firm, an angel, an advisor who really believes in them and wants to back them. Not just in good times when everything's great, but in bad times as well. Because even though over time you want the company to be a great success story, it'll have a lot of bumps along the way. And if you have someone who's there, um, really helping you out in the bad times, it increases the chance of you doing well. So, you know, with the current environment, you know, we're finding the good companies are raising money at, you know, really good valuations. Uh, the companies that haven't been able to find product market fit, haven't executed appropriately, uh, maybe they've been incredibly unlucky, but they're not uh, getting funded. Um, and, you know, the ones in between, they, they need to work out which direction they want to go in. You know, I think the determining factor is that hyper-growth is not a natural state. And venture capital requires hyper-growth, right? Your whole business premise is based on these hyper-growth companies. So maybe you find product market, maybe an entrepreneur finds product market fit, but cannot find that kind of heavy acceleration. And that means that they're going to be building smaller companies and they have to build these smaller companies in a capital efficient way and um, exit quickly with you know, very small amounts of capital. And I think because we are in 2017, tons of things have already been built. The internet is more than 20 years old. There's a ton of stuff out there that has already been built, but there are lots of niche opportunities which need to be built not in the traditional venture capital model. And I think the fallacy of our industry is that we are trying to package all of these into the venture capital box, and that is, that is unviable and unsustainable. I, to to I totally agree. There's only a subset of businesses that should take outside money yeah. and a subset of those that should take venture money. There are many great businesses, and you gave an example earlier, where the company can grow substantially and not take uh, money from outside um, investors and do great. You know, but, well, but that is a, an outlier. That level of success is an outlier. That is actually a venture scale success, company. All success are outliers. <laughs> but but I mean, think about yeah. it. I mean, if the company does five million, ten million, twenty million in revenue in a maybe not in a hyper fast scale, maybe in a linear scale. That is still a successful business. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, last I, trend I don't, question. I don't disagree yeah. at all. The so last trend question is about unicorns. Uh, of course, you know, I would say around 14, 15, 16, we saw unicorn mania. Unicorn mania started to rationalize a little bit in 16. This year it has stabilized. But there is still a huge amount of late-stage capital out there. A lot of traditional VCs have raised very large funds. And um, as a seed investor, you could get buried under later stage liquidation preferences if valuations run up like that. How do you protect yourself? Well, if valuations run up, you're fine. It's when valuations stall or run back that you have issues. Um, but, but, Both but, happens, but, right? So once valuations yeah. uh, runs up and then valuations stack mm -hmm. because the, the fundamentals don't deliver to valuations. Right. So, so – we look at it this way, and, and, I, and I think it's an interesting lens. We look at it as to whether the valuation is based on alpha or beta. And what I mean by alpha is would a value-based investor go, that's a reasonable valuation? Or is it all based on future promise and optionality and not really supported? 
a simple way to think about it. Let's say you have revenue, you've had revenue for a few years, and you're growing revenue of 50 to 100% year over year. There's a multiple range for your business. It may be four times, it may be 10 times revenue run rate that's sort of reasonable. But if it's, you know, if the, if the round is done at 20 times revenue run rate and you don't believe that the revenues can accelerate but may decelerate from there, yeah. then, there's, then there's quite a lot of beta, let alone if there's no revenue. So I, I think that it's the, your exposure is on the beta side with regard to those. I think there's also something else here which is often not discussed. Back in the mid-90s, the large bulge bracket firms, firms like um, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, would take companies public that were doing 30, 40, 50 million in revenue, mm -hmm. and they would raise the, you know, 20, 30, 50 million dollars in capital as part of those IPOs. And they did that because the fees, 7% of capital raise, was material to them. 20 years has gone by, these firms have grown to be much bigger, and now they don't want to take a company public unless the market cap is a billion, maybe 700 million. 500 million they really hate. And so companies now have to be significantly larger to go public. And not only that, but when they go public, they need to have accelerating revenue not decelerating revenue. And I think we've seen, yeah. you know, with a company like, like Blue Apron, decelerating revenue has not um, made it fare well in the public markets. And so what they've done, because the brokers are so large, they've basically taken out of the U.S. economy a really important strap of funding for companies that are doing 30 to 100 million in revenue. Um, that otherwise would have gone public. Some of them would have done become penny stocks. Others would have become, you know, very large companies with easier access to capital. And so what's happened is venture funds have raised larger funds to go and sort of fill in that gap. And that's why I think we're seeing the unicorns. They're staying public, they're staying private longer in part because that they have to be, have so much more hat before they can go public now than what it used to be 20 years ago. And I think that's a disservice to the economy. I think it serves the business models of the large bulge bracket um, uh, banks and broker dealers, but I really think it's a disservice to the economy. And thank goodness that venture capitalists have seen the, the ability to come in and help bridge these companies to the point that they can become significant enough and stable enough to go public. So I actually think the unicorns are an interesting group of companies. Are all, are all of them going to make it? No. But a lot of them will, and they've made significant change in people's lives. I look at companies like Airbnb and Uber and Lyft, and if it wasn't for the private markets, those companies wouldn't be there, and the tens of millions of people they touch every year wouldn't benefit from those companies and those ideas. I just wrote an article called uh, Will SoftBank Own Silicon Valley? <laughs> I'm sure you're following what SoftBank is doing. What are your thoughts? I think, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a natural extension. But it's very difficult for SoftBank to cut a $200,000 check into a company. Right. When it's getting going, or a million check, or a $10 million check. They want to build their a $1 trillion dollar fund, well. <laughs> right, right. So their checks are much larger, and they're coming in and providing a need um, uh, to companies. And I think that's good. Yeah. I think that's good. All right, good. so, uh, John, wonderful conversation. We could go on and on, but we do have to work with some investor, uh, some entrepreneurs, and you have to run. I, but uh, do let's follow up on the Indiegogo uh, relationship, and we also have a lot of enterprise deals in our portfolio that uh, we can start looking at together. Thank you for coming well, today. Ab absolutely. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, my you. Twitter handle is John underscore Franco. If anyone is interested in following me on Twitter. All right. 
Okay, folks, we are going to switch to the mentoring portion of the conversation today. Let me set some expectations. This is a working session. We are completely on your side. It's a safe place. You can let your guard down and speak candidly about your issues, and we will try to give you feedback and help you, you know, remove roadblocks or, or develop strategies so that you can navigate through those roadblocks. Roadblocks are absolutely common, and every entrepreneur will face roadblocks. That's not a surprise that you have roadblocks. We all have roadblocks. Um, the one thing that I want to also say is that receiving feedback is also something that you need to become comfortable with because the more you can talk to experienced people uh, who can give you candid, constructive critique, the more you will learn. But you have to develop, you know, certain amount of confidence in yourself to receive that feedback, process that feedback, and do something with it. Don't let that feedback destroy your self-esteem and, and let you fall apart. Um, you may disagree with feedback you get here or elsewhere. Don't feel bad about that. Eventually, it's your venture. You will make the strategic decisions, but it is bound to be the case that there will be holes in your investment thesis or in your business strategy. And it is our job to help you find those gaps and fill those gaps. Now, one thing you have to remember, and you may have followed this conversation earlier uh, with John, and, and it's a fact that not, not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money does not guarantee success. And that is a fact of the venture business. You have to keep that in mind. You have to execute to that. You have to factor that in in your business strategy. Otherwise, you're going to fail. Um, there are many ways of succeeding. But if you try to fit a square peg in a round hole, that is not going to turn into a success. So with that, let's go to Jill Angelo and start um, the mentoring portion of the program. Jill, please unmute your line and tell us what you're doing. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. All right. Um, well, thank you. Thanks for having me today. Um, uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Genev, uh, which is a digital health platform for women's health in midlife. Um, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, our focus uh, is women kind of 40 plus. There's about 50 million women today in the U.S. that um, experience midlife health changes associated with menopause. And a lot of these are driven by hormone tra changes um, that lead to things like insomnia, um, anxiety, hot flashes, loss of libido. And it can be a real transition in a woman's life. Um, typically, to find relief, women spend about $26 billion on both traditional and non-traditional uh, treatments or products, um, as well as even prescriptions. And our goal in helping these women is to really do two things. Number one, help bring down the cost of finding relief for their symptoms um, so that they can self-manage their health. And number two, get them to relief faster. Because a lot of women today, there's no road um, there's no roadmap uh, for women's menopausal health. Uh, today, typically women uh, use a lot of search or ask friends and family. There's really nothing addressing this audience. Um, and if you, if you want to advance the slide, um, when you think about the overall femtech market, um, and we'll go ahead and just advance to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, Femtech is um, a, a space of women's health that's growing incredibly well. Um, in 2016, there was 1.1 billion invested, um, but a lot of it was invested in women's health in the earlier stages of their lives, when they're menstruating or um, going through pregnancy and fertility changes in their bodies. Um, nothing really focused on menopausal health, and that's where Genev sees a huge opportunity, um, simply because it's an unmet space with women with incredible spending power and looking for relief for, again, changing health symptoms that I talked a little bit about earlier. So how we're doing that is with the digital health platform for women. And what this is, is women come to Geneb.com and they can um, find community, uh, a health concierge, as well as a marketplace of products. And what this looks like in terms of women coming to the platform, um, we really have found that 
Um, women are searching out symptoms. Um, there's over 4 million per month for women's menopausal health. And so we're capitalizing on that search volume to drive them through content marketing to our platform. Uh, and our customers over the last 12 months um, since launching our initial marketplace. So in play today, we have a marketplace that sells a line of feminine healthcare products that my co-founder brought to the business. And we launched it a year ago to just start building an audience and start gaining some of that traction you talked about earlier um, in your conversation. And so the journey that a customer takes through the system is they subscribe, it's a freemium model to the platform. And once they're in, they have access to community, they have access to our marketplace of healthy products. And in January, we're launching a health concierge where women can book appointments with health providers. And then right thereafter, we'll be launching a health assessment, which is a machine learning backed health assessment that is an intake so that over time, we, based on a woman's personal data, we can um, serve up to her products and services um, based on what she needs. And this really serves our mission of trying to cut costs to get, and to get women to relief faster um, in their overall health. If you wanna go ahead and advance to the next slide, um, we believe our approach is unique, um, primarily because we're reducing that complexity of wading through lots of products and um, answers by curating them in our marketplace as well as in our content and personalizing that to women based on their health, the health intake that we um, pull from them. Uh, we're also using the power, again, of algorithms to serve that up to a mass audience, but pairing it also with human judgment with our health concierge. A woman can book a live appointment with a health provider, and we've seen this in models like Stitch Fix, for example, in the fashion space. They've paired automated machine learning algorithms to serve up fashion choices, but also they pair that with a personal uh, stylist. And we think that same personal plus technology approach is the unique approach to this audience. Um, and then finally, because it is women's health, we're building a trusted ecosystem. Uh, our business model, we make money in three ways. Um, obviously through the online marketplace, it's e-commerce marketplace of offering our own first party products today. Um, soon again, I mentioned we'll launch the health concierge um, and we'll charge for a video appointment um, for $25. And we've done some initial research with our audience of 12,000 women telling us a little bit more about what they'd spend in that space. And then we are publishing a lot of content. We soon will monetize that content just to help support the revenue line of the company. We're not necessarily a media company, but it's our go-to-market approach, and we think there's a real opportunity there to monetize that as well. Go ahead and advance. Um, I talked a little bit about year one accomplishments we got in market a year ago. Um, we started obviously first by reaching out to women to understand what they needed. And we launched our marketplace with our line of feminine care products that focus on dryness and hygiene. Um, as well, we launched um, a blog and a, and a podcast channel um, and have worked with over 175 health providers over the past year uh, to really help them uh, or to really bring credible information to our audience. Um, we've built a good audience and since that time, we are now really merging this marketplace and blog into a full digital platform by adding in the health concierge and community platforms um, and machine learning. Uh, and we really took that time to understand how does technology best serve this audience. Uh, and so that 12 months of learning has been key to our business. I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next. I talked a little bit about our marketing approach. Um, obviously, in year one, we wanted to establish our brand. Um, we've done some great press. We've got even our line of products out on Amazon just because it's the biggest marketplace out there and it's been a good way to drive some revenue and grow our brand outside of our own marketplace. Um, and in the next 18 months, we're really focusing on growing our audience um, through partnerships, through going to women's events, Facebook and SEO optimization, and really um, optimizing that funnel conversion metrics that we've started to track so far. This is a little bit about our funnel. We can come back to it, certainly, but um, just a few key points that I want to pull out. Um, we are working to become a thought leader in women's menopausal health because there is so little out there for women. And so we've quickly raised in the last six months to the top to be in the top 10 results for over 375 women's health searches. 
um, we're growing our audience at 35% month over month, and we're converting them to free subscribers at a 2% rate, and that's an area where we think we can really grow. Um, of that 2%, then we're further converting to purchase, obviously, of our feminine line of products in our marketplace, as well as through Amazon. And today, of our 12,000 subscribers, we've got 9,000 customers um, that are averaging, that spend an average of a, average of about $14 per um, purchase with us. And then of those 9,000, 27% are repeating their purchase with us. And what is the revenue number right now? What is your run rate? Um, we will run rate um, on a monthly basis is anywhere from 20 to 22,000 gross, um, and for 2017 will come in at around 235, 235,000. Okay. This is our team. Um, we've got a background in technology. I myself, I'm former Microsoft. I was at a startup prior to Microsoft that was acquired by the company, and I've built global brands there across product marketing mm -hmm. and, and management roles. Um, Michael Latulla is our CTO. Shannon runs all of our content and marketing. And Dr. Rebecca densmore Stu is really helping us launch the new health concierge and will be the voice and focus of, or the voice and the, the provider behind that concierge as we start to roll that out. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead and keep advancing. Um, finally, this just talks a little bit. We're currently raising funds of 1.5. I have raised early, you know, friends and family, a little bit of angel and bootstrap of 535 um, back at the end of 2015 to get the company going and do our initial work. Um, but right now we're in the middle of our $1.5 million raise. Um, we've got about 400,000 committed, and that will really fund R&D um, and expand our management team and really grow our subscriber base. We're really focusing on audience growth because that's, as a B2C company, that's where we, that's where, you know, our core, um, our core value will be is in our audience. Jill, do you have a bottom-up CAM analysis somewhere? That's a requirement for any funding pitch deck. A bottom-up funding, say that one more time, a bottom-up what? Bottom-up TAM analysis, total available market analysis. You have a lot of top-down do. numbers in the beginning, but uh, I didn't see a bottom-up TAM analysis. Yeah, you know, um, in not in this short version. Um, I do have it in the appendix, um, and I'll, I'll just talk you through it real quick. Um, I mentioned there's 50 million women. Of that 50 million, we really see our serviceable address, service addressable market of 2, billion, 2 million women, sorry, and those women are the ones that are just heading into perimenopause. So they're the Gen Xers, mm -hmm. they're savvy in technology, they go to the web for answers, for mm -hmm. services, mm -hmm. for products, um, and we really believe out of that serviceable, addressable market, we can go after um, the uh, um, two, two parts of their spend, and not only in over-the-counter product spend, um, but also in uh, uh, um, doctor spend or, or appointments that they're booking with their physician um, today, looking at the copay amounts that they spend on that because our health concierge really offers uh, a convenient opportunity for them to access a health professional from the convenience of their own home. And what, what does that add up to? So two million, what is the average spend that you can, you think you can tap into of, for the two million that you are targeting? So um, we see overall um, this of this two, uh, I'm sorry, it is 22 million women. I said two million, 22 million. Um, it, we see we can tap into $2 billion of annual spend. And we see from those women today, um, we think we can probably capitalize on um, about right now, we've got a lifetime revenue or a lifetime value of 379 based on both product purchases and health concierge usage. What is that annual? That 379 is multi-year. What what portion of their wallets do you think you can get? You know, that's a great that's a great question, and I haven't pulled it down to annual. Um, uh, I take that both as a question and a bit of feedback. Um, but in terms of right now, we we see repeat purchase of every three to four months. And so doing the math, um, that would look like, uh, that would look like um, 80 to $100 per year. Per year, 80 to customer. $100 yeah. per year. The other thing that yeah. I would do is to segment, uh, you know, the, of the 22 million, where is the low-hanging fruit? What, you know, what is the lifestyle? See, 22 million is a very large segment. 
For you mm -hmm. to get high velocity growth, you need to pinpoint which segment is really, you know, pre-menopausal or approaching menopause is a very broad segmentation. You need to understand your customer at a, you know, in consumer marketing, you need to kind of understand that segment much more uh, precisely to be able to market to that. Yes, you can do SEO and there's, a, it, it sounds like there's a significant SEO volume and, and that's going to get you some of them, but what is the profile of this woman that you are trying to sell these products to? And and it's going to, you know, pare down your segment segmentation to maybe two, three million, but it's going to be more precise and you will have a clearer understanding of how to market to that segment. Mm -hmm. I, would, yeah. Yeah. I would want to see that before... Um, you know, for example, by the way, there is a you know, what 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 I really like about your venture is that ten years ago I wrote a an article that defined Web 3.0. You know, we were at that time we were all talking about Web 2.0, and I defined Web 3.0 as a, a formula, which is 4C plus P plus VS. 4C is content, community, commerce in context. P is personalization, and VS is vertical search. So that in context, you know, full service content, community, commerce, personalization, vertical search is, I think, the way um, e-commerce is best um, delivered. So mm -hmm. it, you have a lot of those ingredients and elements in your uh, vision, which I like very much. Um, I did a fashion company in 1999. It was one of the first online fashion companies ever. And what we did was really focus on the busy professional woman of a certain age group, high end. And, you know, with that segmentation, we basically arrived at the conclusion that our, with just, you know, a million women, women spending, and these are the high spenders who really spend on fashion. People spend a lot of money. High-end fashion consumers spend a lot of money with a very small amount of wallet share. You know, $1,000 in the high-end is per year is not, not a huge amount. You can easily get up to a billion dollars in spend. So you have to create your own, you know, segmentation and figure out who is that woman that you're going after, how do you really precisely characterize and define that woman and find the smaller number of the 22 million, but that is really easy and, and focused so that you can target that woman through her lifestyle. That's great. That's very good feedback. Um, because right now we have been, it, it is, we're, you know, we've seen our audience be so broad and spread out and we aren't, we aren't intentionally going after it with a focus. Right. Right, right now, your yeah. only customer acquisition strategy is SEO and content marketing. And that is fine. Mm -hmm. That will get you some distance. But through that, you're going to need to understand your customer much better so that you can really have a, a more full, cir full circle customer acquisition strategy than just SEO and content marketing. So to mm -hmm. scale, you're going to need that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank so, you. So uh, good you. luck Anything with your else? funding. Thank you. Uh, Thank I'm you going to so need much. to move on. You're welcome. Good presentation. Very good presentation. Okay. We are going to go to. One second. We're going to skip through Panu, who's not on the call. Jesus, this is a lot of slides. We're going to go to Tim Alichan. Is that how you say your name, Tim? Yes, that's correct. All right, go ahead. What are you working on? Okay. Um, so uh, I work in many different jobs, um, just trying to boost up my business. So a fun fact about me is hopefully what I become the true entrepreneur, I have my own business. I like to do all my title license. I think that's going to come true. So uh, I, I'm very versatile. I uh, teach, I write, I dance hip hop, and I'm doing my hand. 
I have a degree in machining, so I can basically fix anything. Um, basically, my part-time job is um, teaching, and on the side, I sit hard, and I go buy the car from uh, public auctions. Uh, great, next slide. Okay. Uh, my business is to um, buy as many homes I, I, can, I can find. Right now, I have uh, two homes that my parents own. I actually uh, use one of them, and one of them I do use to flip cars. I have about four cars right now that I do try to flip. The thing about the car business is um, there's a lot of bad business out there that deal with cars, especially mechanics, and they're not very reliable. And then there's a lot of, and also sales people that sell cars have bad competition selling bad used cars. So basically, I want to fix that industry. That's what I want to do. So basically, I want to buy. I want to create a forum to buy, sell, and rent cars at a parking lot, which is at my home. That's what I want to do. And uh, if the vehicle is bad, I mean, the car should be salvaged. Right, it should be put in junkyard. It should be put away, and there are incentives to that by the government, where you can make like a thousand dollars or thousand five on it, and that's that's basically free money if you if you don't pass smog the second year round. So this incentives out there to the car salvage. Um, the basically my business is to if you have a driveway, you can basically I can basically sell your car for you. That's what I want, and on the side. Uh, the house that I do have, I want to do either Airbnb or just shut that room out to make extra money. That's my, that's my idea right now. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, Auto Exchange Incorporated. Uh, that's what I want to call my business. Um, so we uh, we provide affordable sales, repair, and really sub to sublet. Let's see uh, what I want to do. Great, go ahead to the next slide. So, customers have options to sub a room. We have the option to buy a car, or if you have a car, we can provide basic repairs and turn up in our auto shop garage. So, basically, the garage I want to turn to the auto, auto garage. What else? Tim, I. I'm having a lot of difficulty understanding what you're trying to do. So let me see if I understand. You are saying that you want to create a network of neighborhood auto mechanics who will come to people's homes and um, and, and do the tuning and, and repairs. Is that what you're saying? Well, I do potentially, but for now that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. I want to set up myself. Basically, I want to own as many houses as possible, and each house has a garage where I can repair cars. And I think that's doable. So you I expect have people to let you turn their garages and, and driveways into auto shops? Uh, in the future, I do because basically it's going to be a the model can be a business employee owned business. But for now, I'm going to buy my own house. I'm not going to let you do that with my driveway or my garage, that's for sure. So That's fine. Some, <laughs> other people might, some people out there might do it. But for now, I'm going to do it to my, my own homes, right? For now, I have, like, a couple homes already. I want to buy my own homes and do that to each home and basically have a whole bunch of homes in different cities and keep doing that. So it's basically going to be like a uh, so, – all the garage repair. But is that a reasonable assumption? Have you done any validation that people – do you have any confidence that people are willing to let you do that? I don't know. Because that's your first step. I think the first thing you need to do is to validate if that assumption is a reasonable assumption. Are people in large mm -hmm. numbers willing to let you turn their homes into auto shops? I agree. There needs to be researched and surveyed and talked to people. But I'm doing it now, and it's working out fine for me. Uh, I just want more people to do that. Uh, so I, I wish that would happen. Um, what else? Yeah, so I, I think that is the key uh, point in what you're trying to do here. If that assumption is a validated assumption, then you, you can even start building this business and developing the business plan and so forth. So my suggestion to you is to first go out and 
get a statistically number, a significant number, like hundreds of um, customer conversations where people are willing to do what you want them to do is turning their driveways and garages into auto shops. See if you can get hundreds of homeowners to do that or are we willing to do that or to say to you that, yes, I'm willing to do that. And that that is the single biggest assumption in the concept that you're presenting here. And without validating that concept, I don't think you should move forward and do anything else. Because yeah, I think it's I a very big assumption and it doesn't resonate mm -hmm. with me at all. So I'm having a very hard time assuming that it will resonate with anybody. It yeah, might though. I, I, I'm not a I'm not a tall your target audience, but there may be a profile of people, and then you need to understand what is the profile of the homeowner who is willing to do that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. That's why I'm here on this uh, platform. Yeah. So go find a couple of hundred, you know, people like that. Talk to them, and then get a detailed understanding of what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do, and then we can figure out how to move your business forward. But that validation is your immediate next step. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samana. It's okay. just a pitch. All right. Good luck. Thank you. We are going to move to Helena Ginot. How do you say Gino? Ginot. Ginot. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, so my name is Helena Ginot. I live in Roselle, New Jersey. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, my company is Holistic Thinking, um, and the premise is uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses um, don't really have a budget for back office, um, and back office is key in moving your, your company forward. So uh, I was an administrative and executive assistant for about 20 years. Uh, I've supported high-level individuals. And so I see how um, paperwork can get away from you, administrative work can get away from you because you're focused solely on your business. Um, so with small businesses and entrepreneurs not really having uh, a huge budget to customize software around what it is that they do, how they work, how they talk. Um, I came up with a solution, and it's it's really a service because I'm using someone else's platform. Um, so I take a, an inexpensive platform. Um, a lot of people have been asking, what do you use for CRMs? You know, how do you manage your, uh, your invoices, your paperwork? Um, I've taken a, a very inexpensive platform that is really like a vanilla screen. Um, and most people have tried to use those platforms, that platform, but have moved away from it because they don't, they don't understand how to customize it around their business from stage to stage. So they may be able to do the CRM portion, but then how does the CRM portion work with the invoicing portion? Um, so like I said, so uh, actually, uh, Helena, small. are you familiar with Zoho? Um, I am, and it's a platform that's very comparable to Zoho. So Zoho is going after this market. This is this is a core market for them, and and they've built a billion dollar business catering to this market. So, um, mm -hmm. are you? So are you building on top of a platform like Zoho? Yes. Okay. What are you doing now? Elaborate on what are you doing? So um, so I go in and I talk to a client and I, I understand what their business is um, and their process from A to Z, where they see their limitations as far as um, where they get the most complaints from clients. Um, so I try and streamline their process A to Z and make sure that there are no gaps from, so um, a, a company can, can be comprised of several departments or even if it's a one-person department, um, everybody's focused on their goals specifically uh, for their department. And so it oftentimes- It sounds like it's, very small business consulting, Helena. Okay. 
And um, if you, I, I've done it for, I've done it for a couple of size businesses. So I've done it for an attorney's office. I've done it for a property management company that had 250 buildings. Um, so I've done it for various sizes. It's, and and how I, how I did it was. I saw the need for it. So I saw how they were operating their administrative portion of how they managed so these their are business. Not and I the, hold on. What you're saying is that the six or organizations where you've done it are not the very small businesses. They a nonprofit with 250 members, that is not a very small, that is not the, you know, one person, two person shop. You're talking about businesses that have some heft. Um, you know, a 60 unit construction job, et cetera. I mean, it, it sounds like you have, you're going and offering consulting services to companies that have a little bit of size and you're helping streamline their processes, which is, which is a very reasonable, um, you know, a reasonable service, I imagine. So what is, help me understand your question. You're, you're trying to, are you doing this for free for these six companies that you've done it? Are you, have you done it for free or have you done it paid? Um, so I've charged for all of them, um, but I've charged a small amount. So I've charged 1200 to set up the, the platform because there is a lot of work that goes into it. Um, uh, my, my initial slides that I was preparing have uh, somewhat of a demonstration of how the workflow works. But um, but what I'm, I'm trying to do is uh, to get in with people who are starting up new businesses um, because they don't quite know yet what that uh, back office work is going to entail. And so based on what I've done so far for other people, um, I've come up with uh, templates for different types of organizations. So I would put it in place for them so that when they're working, um, they're not missing any of the, the key elements for the, their administrative work. Um, and it's streamlined so that they spend a lot less time working on their admin work than they are in their actual business. So, um, Helena, are you familiar with Upwork? Yes. A lot of the recruiting for the kinds of things you're talking about, like, you know, CRM administration, a lot of that kind of recruiting happens on Upwork for small businesses. Startups and small businesses go to these platforms like Upwork and post jobs, post their projects, and, and hire people from those sources. And it's a very, very crowded market. I mean, there are, you know, CRM administrators for various different systems, and there are tons of those, and, you know, um, and you're competing with people in India and in the Philippines and, you know, all kinds of places. So. I guess what um, what I'm not convinced about that is that this is a very scalable thing uh, that you can build. So it's, it's basically you you're going to need to sell consulting services, and you can sell consulting services in a in a community format. You can sell consulting services. You can do what you're trying to do. You can list yourself on Upwork and bid for these projects and, and recruit customers that way and, and, you know, all of that. So those are all viable options. I think what I'm, the question that you need to ask, answer for yourself is how big a business are you trying to build? Are you trying to build something that's scalable? Are you trying to build a small business? that is just yourself selling to a bunch of small businesses, having like maybe 50 small business clients a year kind of business. What are you trying to do? So I am trying to build a scalable business. Um, so initially, um, so like I said, I, I built uh, different templates. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to build templates around industry. And so for each market, um, because not no two markets work the same way. But um, and I do plan on uh, bringing on staff to help me because it, it's it's a lot of work because it's tedious, but it's not it's not hard work. Um, so I actually have my daughter helping me with some of the stuff that I do now. Um, with I, I have all of the the formulas 
So uh, I got I got it. So here's the the issue that you're going to need to um, think through is what is a platform around which there's a lot of people looking for administrative services. So go do a first level market research on Upwork to see what kind of projects, what kind of platforms people are looking for administrators around. And then okay. build your core expertise around that platform. And, and I think, okay. you know, pinning yourself to a platform that has a lot of velocity gives you advantage because that platform is marketing itself to a certain customer base and acquiring right. those customers. And then those customers whom they are acquiring are looking for administrators. So you can, on a repeatable basis, bid for, bid, develop core competency, develop, like for example, if you list yourself on Upwork around, let's say Zoho CRM administration, and, and you develop, okay. Let's say you have serviced 100 clients doing Zoho CRM administration. You develop track record. You develop a lot of, you know, um, credibility on Upwork, and people can look at your work, and and you can and and you build these customer relationships. Then, once you have the relationships, then you can do other things with them. Like, you know, for we hired our um, technical team on Upwork many years ago, okay. and and this is a team out of India that does a whole lot of our technical projects, they do regular maintenance and then we layer on top of that other projects on a regular basis. So um, so once you develop that trust and relationship, then you can do other things uh, for these okay. clients, depending on what they need. So, I, But you, it is important for you to choose a platform that has velocity. Don't choose a little known pa platform that doesn't have any velocity, any name recognition, nothing, because then people are not proactively looking for support or administrative function around the, that platform. You need a platform that has velocity and that is putting a lot of marketing dollars against selling their platform, then you will get the administrative jobs around that. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your advice. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, folks. Um, we are going to go uh, spend a few minutes. I will explain to you how to use 1 million by 1 million, and then we're going to go to Q&A, and we can talk about anything you want, um, any issues that you're dealing with, any roadblocks. You can introduce yourself. Um, get, we can get to know you. We have time still, um, about 15 more minutes, 15, 6, 17 more minutes. But before we do that, I want to ask you to help us a little bit. Um, if you like what we do here at One Million by One Million, please refer the program to Serious Entrepreneurs. We need your help in reaching other serious entrepreneurs who are looking for this kind of help. And, and that referral is really our source of getting quality entrepreneurs because there is a class of entrepreneurs who have very unrealistic expectations. They're not willing to put in the work required to build a significant company. That's not the kind of entrepreneurs we're looking for. We're looking for serious entrepreneurs who are really looking to build block by block serious companies. Okay, so everything resource-wise for 1 million by 1 million is at 1mby1m.com, our website. You'll find a blog that is free and that is rich with great learning materials. You learn a lot just by following the blog. If you do nothing else and just follow the blog, a lot of people learn just by doing that. Um, the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, we have published 12 volumes of them. These are case study based books, 12 to 16 case studies per volume. And we double click down on specific topics. You could double click down on how companies, how entrepreneurs have built unicorn companies. That's a billion dollar unicorns book. You can double click down on the topic of bootstrapping with a paycheck or bootstrapping using services, e-commerce, cloud computing, um, women entrepreneurs. There are books that you can learn about that specific topic in case study format through the Entrepreneur Journeys book series. All of it is on Amazon. These roundtables happen week after week after week. And we have had thousands and thousands of people participate over the years, and we will continue in January every week pretty much. We have these roundtables. The full acceleration program from 1 million by 1 million is a $1,000 annual membership fee. 
We offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a full curriculum that is over 300 hours worth of curriculum material. It will take you about 50 to 100 hours to digest the core curriculum, which you have to master to be able to bridge the you know, steep learning curve of a first-time entrepreneur usually. And um, that is also a case study-based curriculum, case studies and video lectures. You can do it at your own time. We help you in the premium program. We help you with business development. We help you with strategy consulting, these kinds of roundtables. We have private members-only versions of these where we work on your projects. We help you with financing, and we help you with media relations. We have a lot of cloud in the media. We have a huge Rolodex of both potential customers, um, channel partners, investors, media analysts, and we will be happy to connect you to them. All this is part of the premium membership. We recommend that you go to the 1M1M self-assessment on the, on the website. These are the questions uh, investors are looking to answer. And you are going to have to answer these questions if you have any interest in funding. So try to answer these questions. If you get stuck, if there's any kind of methodology gap that you encounter, you can easily start learning the core curriculum and the, and the electives in, on a curriculum-only subscription basis at $99 a month. And that is one of the most efficient ways of plugging methodology gaps in your first-time entrepreneur scenario. So dig around on the website. There's tons of content, tons of explanations, what to expect from premium, what to expect from basic, FAQs, video FAQs. Um, you know, this program is very much for people who are good self-learners, and we believe that good entrepreneurs need to be good self-learners. If you're not a good self-learner, it's going to be very hard for you to be a good entrepreneur. And you do need discipline. You do need, um, you know, rigor to be able to learn what you need to learn very rapidly. We have created a very efficient platform for learning and a very efficient community through which you can get ahead. But you're going to have to put in the work. And if you're not willing to put in the work, don't join this program. Because this is not a program where you can – it's like a gym membership. It's just by buying the gym membership, you don't lose weight and you don't get in shape. You have to do the work. So don't buy the membership if you're not going to do the work. But if you're willing to do the work, this is a great gym, great entrepreneur gym, and you can get a lot out of it. We have for many years now, we have trained entrepreneur after entrepreneur to become successful. Um, and it is very much a case study and community-based program. We have a lot of, you know, powerful people, very effective people in the community. You can learn through their journeys, through their case studies, and you'll get to work with them where, where appropriate. Um, the methodology is lean, capital-efficient bootstrap startups. Uh, even if you raise money, you're going to have to bootstrap first, get to some degree of validation, and then raise money. Um, and as I said, there is a lot of media clout here. We can get the word out about what you're doing, get you in front of people who matter and so forth. So the next few free roundtables are January 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th, pretty much every Thursday in January. Um, we also have in-person rendezvous. So if you're either from the Bay Area, based in the Bay Area, or visiting the Bay Area, we're going to have rendezvous pretty much every week, usually on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time at Cafe Boroni in Menlo Park. So you can swing by and, and just have a cup of coffee, chat, and, you know, get a face-to-face -face interaction. We meet for about an hour, hour and a half, and just, you know, hang out, basically. They're very intimate, uh, small rendezvous, and, and they've been very, very popular. We experimented with those in, in the fall. Um, we've done one a month, and then we are now accelerating that into once a week. Okay, so um, now we are ready for Q&A. So if you would like to call in, you're welcome to. If you'd like to put in your questions, comments, introductions, feedback, roadblocks, or anything in the public chat, make sure you set your, you set your public chat to send to all participants, and then you, you are able to communicate with the whole room. And while you're doing that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you'd like to join the program, Irina would be happy to answer any questions you might have about the program. Go ahead and reach out to Irina. 
and uh, she'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, Samir Penkar is asking, how do you and your team stay abreast with all that is happening in this ecosystem, tech, financing, trends, etc.? We have been doing this for over 10 years. Samir, you should study the blog. The, the blog is, a, is considered one of the most credible blogs in the industry in terms of trends and, and so forth. We have a very strong methodology of research and reporting. We have a research team that produces the blog. It's not easy to do, by the way. It takes huge core competency to do what we do. Anybody else? Questions, comments, introductions? Please introduce yourselves. Let us get to know one another. Han Ui, where are you dialing from, Han? And what are you working on? Dialing from Houston. And what is your business? Company is creating a wearable platform for firearms. Why wearable platform for firearms? What does that mean, Han? Train on real guns in virtual and augmented reality, I see. Okay. Anybody else? Any other introductions? Hans' idea is being helped, being to help law enforcement make better decisions. I see, okay. So you want to simulate law enforcement use cases and train law, en law enforcement people in real scenarios. Good, good idea. Anybody else? Any other introductions? Questions, comments, feedback? Did you find the session today useful? Ramesh Varanasi is introducing himself. Go ahead, Ramesh. Where are you dialing from? What are you working on? Your question is, what is the scope for SaaS market? Well, um, SaaS market in India. Um, so there are two kinds of businesses that have been developing in uh, Indian in the Indian SaaS market. There is SaaS that is Indian um, business facing, and then there is SaaS that is global business facing. So if you look at companies like Freshdesk, Dhruva, these are global facing SaaS products. And if you look at companies like um, Great Tip. For example, that's an Indian market facing SaaS product. And both of those are abundant in the market right now, and many interesting companies have been developed on that premise. So it's a, but it's a crowded market, so you're going to have to find where the gaps are, what the competitive landscape is, et cetera. Does that answer your question? Education industry also in India is a question also with respect to India. Um, you know, the, the good news is that in the Indian market, people tend to spend on education. Um, but it's also a market that is very crowded and there are lots of players and not many of those are monetizing very well. So the problem with the Indian market when it comes to content is, and it's true about the worldwide market actually, is um, lack of monetization. People don't like to pay for content, and this has been a problem um, with the education industry very, um, you know, for the longest time. Um, so that's 
something that you're going to have to research. You're going to have to figure out where are opportunities for offering paid services because, you know, unless you have paying customers, you don't have a business. Free users are not customers, right? So if you have a business that, or if you have an offering that a lot of free users are willing to use but not pay for, don't get into that business. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments, feedback? If not, we're going to uh, Adjourn, Samir Penkar is saying, learned a lot from these roundtables this year. Very good. Wish you happy holidays as well, Samir. And keep coming back. Use the roundtables to learn. And, uh, and if, when you're ready, you can, you know, upgrade into either basic or premium and, and actually start working on your ventures. I imagine you're coming to these roundtables because you have aspirations of actually building a business. Um, and we have... I would say at this point we have a proven methodology that works and that scales. So, um, so we're very confident about our methodology and how we work and how we train entrepreneurs. There's many, many years of success. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things about having these numerous entrepreneurs who have gone through the, through the program over the years is starting to see real numbers like this fall. Um, an entrepreneur who has been in this program for a few years early on in his journey came to see me, and they're doing $10 million a year right now in bootstrapped revenues. They have a 500-people organization, and that's very nice to see. For us, it's very nice to see. We have people in the million-dollar revenue range. We'll have people in the $4 million revenue range, and then they are the you know, outlier successes like Fresh Desk that has raised $150 million in revenue, uh, in funding and has, you know, many tens of millions of dollars in revenue. They're on, you know, they're going for the full, you know, unicorn kind of business and that's also working. So you can be successful at many different levels in many different styles and we have good experience on all of those within technology, within IT. We don't do anything outside IT. All right, folks, wish you happy holidays, everybody. Enjoy your uh, time. Enjoy your dying down time. Charge up the batteries, and uh, we will see you in the new year, either in person or online here, and uh, we'll continue working. These are working sessions. The working sessions are going to be available to you week after week after week for hopefully a long, long time. Thank you again for coming today. Bye.